Let's have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. And as I've said several times in this worship service, even when we have a special emphasis, even when we focus on fathers or mothers or, or whatever special event that we do, the worship service is always about God. We look towards that. We give it our focus. We give it our dedication. We look to your word. And we look at eternal truth. That is reliable today just as it ever was. We thank you for that. And right now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that your Holy Spirit make revelation known to every person in this room through your word, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Turn with me uh, in your Bibles to Genesis, the sixth chapter, verses 9 and 10. And then you put, might want to put a little marker in there, and we're going to jump over to Genesis 9, 18 through 25. Now, this is our, our fourth message in, in the series, and there's, there's more to come, a uh, series of uh, dis, dysfunctional families in the book of Genesis. Now, we, we spent about three weeks talking about Adam and Eve. We are going to, in a few weeks, we're going to go back to Cain and Abel and kind of trying to get things back in sequence, but because it's Father's Day, I wanted to jump forward a little bit and, and take a look at Noah, all right? Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, this is a strange series in that we tend to look at people that most of us look at as, as heroes or leaders or significant people in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, and particularly as we get further on and, and look at the patriarchs, we say, well, there's, you know, there's examples of people that did things right. Well, quite often we find out that when it comes to family relationships, they did a lot of things wrong. And we're going to be learning from what they did wrong, and hopefully this will give us a focus on how to do things right. However, let me say that today we're going to look at a guy that did things right, at least most of the time. Wait till we get to the, 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 the backside of the sermon. Now, let me just kind of catch up with you a little bit. Uh, in chapter, uh, chapter 5 in the book of Genesis, we see the descendants of Adam, and this is all really, to me, it's fascinating to follow through that. And we have a time where there is a population explosion. Now, during this time, we see in chapter 6 that, that God limits the, the lifespan of, of a man to 120 years, even though we'll see that, that, uh, that, that uh, Noah's going to live a lot more than that, a lot longer than that. And also in chapter 6, we see a complete breakdown of humanity. It gets bad, and folks, really, really, really bad. Now, you may, you may look at, at how things are right now and, and think, well, how bad can it really get? How, how, how bad can it get before God just comes in and, and just applies complete, <laughs> complete justice to us in retribution for our sins? Well, folks, apparently it got much, much, much worse than anything that we're facing right now. And God, even in his grace, even in his mercy, he also has a side of him that is also very just. He does not put up with sin, and he, he certainly comes down. Remember last week we talked about spiritual math? The spiritual math comes down, and it comes down, and he says, Man, I, I, I'm just sorry that I created the whole mess. I'm going to just take it out. I'm going to wipe it out and start all over, except for one righteous man. I'll tell you something. God will do a lot for one righteous man. God will alter history for one righteous man. And even though last week I mentioned to you that we're all sons of, of Adam, we're also all sons of of Noah because once again God wipes it out and he decides to start all over again turn with me take a look at Genesis the sixth chapter verses 9 and 10 these are the family records of Noah Noah was a righteous man blameless among his contemporaries Noah walked with God and Noah fathered three sons him Shem Ham 
and Japheth. Now, there's a few things I want you to notice about, about uh, Noah. First of all, he was righteous. Now, righteousness means that you have a strong sense and knowledge of what is right and wrong. Who gets to decide what right and wrong is? Well, as Christians, we believe that God decides what right and wrong is. You, you kind of get to do that when you're the creator of the universe. And so Noah was about the last man on earth that agreed with God over what was right and was wrong. So he was a righteous man. Fathers, this morning, you want to give the biggest gift back to your children? Be a righteous man. And what standard do we work by? What, what yardstick do we work with? Well, it's God's standard. God sets what righteousness is. And here's number two. We also see that he is blameless. Now, what blamelessness is, is basically knowing what righteousness is and doing it. Okay? It's, it's putting action to what you know is right. You're really not that righteous if you know what to do and you don't do it. Noah was a man that not only knew what was righteous, he also did what was righteous. Fathers, I don't have to tell you, people are looking. I'm not just talking about your preacher running around town. I've got, I've got limited perspective. I can't tell you what's going on all the time or even much of the time, frankly. Who knows most about whether or not you're blameless in your walk? What's well, the people that, people that are closest to you? It's the people that you have the most influence on. You want to give a gift to your children? A continued, continued, continued gift that goes on and blesses them generationally? Goes on to the next, the next, the next. The Bible talks about going on to the third and the fourth generation. Be blameless in your walk. And number three, he walked with God. Now, what that means is that he had a relationship with God. It doesn't mean that, that God necessarily took on flesh and, and they, they went and took, took long walks together kind of for his cardiovascular health. It wasn't about that. It meant that he had intimacy with God. Now, if you're righteous and blameless, you're obviously walking according to God's standard. How do you know what that is? Because sometimes, yes, yes, we, we have, in Scripture, we have very black and white things, and, and it, th do this, don't do that. But sometimes our resolve gets a little weakened. Sometimes, if we're not walking closely with God, it gets, it gets a little gray, where it once seemed black and white. A relationship with God is like any other relationship. Any relationship that you have that you want to grow and develop, you have to spend time with fathers you of all people need to spend time with god whoever thought that spirituality was a feminine thing i mean not that it's not but does that mean that that men are excluded from it fathers you're called to be leaders you set the example with leadership comes responsibility. The burden and the blessing of leadership is even heavier on you. That's, that's really God's plan. Now, now not that, that God doesn't, God doesn't you know, kind of bridge the gap and make other things work, but you're the original plan. You're the original intention. Walk with God. Now, God gave Noah a big assignment, and you know, even, even people that weren't raised in Sunday school know about Noah and the ark and all that type of thing. And, and he gives them a big assignment. He tells them to big, build a, a big boat. Now let me tell you about the, sky, the scale of this boat. This boat, this ark, is one and a half times the length of a football field. Okay, I knew, you know, since we love football around here so much, that, that would make sense to you. I don't know how that translates in basketball. But anyway, North Carolina. Anyway, but... It was one and a half times the size of a football field. And it was about half the, half the width. So it was kind of a long, narrow boat. It was about the, about the height of the steeple. All right? Now, let me also tell you this, that it's not like you go out to Lowe's and buy, a, buy an ark kit. 
okay? No, you, you have to kind of think about what, what you're doing. And not only that, you don't go to the lumber yard and, and put in a big order for pine. You go out, you cut the logs, you dress the logs yourself, which is basically using a stone axe at that time, we think. You get your own tar, you put the thing together, you seal it up, because you're going to be floating for a long time out there. Folks, this, even with his three sons, this is probably something that took years it might have taken decades. So, is this, is this starting to get a picture in your mind? I mean, you're talking about having a relationship with God. I mean, you're talking about being obedient to God, having a long-term project. I mean, don't, don't we have other things to do besides build a boat in the middle of nowhere? Who knows, it might have been in the middle of the desert that God told him to do this. But God, he was faithful to what God called him to do. And here's another perspective. I mentioned to you that he's the only guy that's righteous besides his, his sons. Now, if you're at work or you're at school and you're trying to get, live a godly life and you're around a, whole lot of, around a whole lot of other men and women that aren't, do they, do they give you an attaboy for doing that? Do they pat you on the back and say, oh, I'm glad we got one righteous guy around here. No, what happens to you? They make fun of you. They humiliate you. Okay? And usually, probably in a culture like this, you've got at least a few righteous people around. There was nobody. Years, decades, people coming by laughing at you. Well, why are you doing this? Well, <laughs> God's, God's going to bring judgment down. He's going to drown all of you. So I'm building a boat out in the middle of nowhere here. Uh, so we'll fly, fly, you know, flood a boat. Well, that's a big boat. No, you, get, you only got three sons and, and of course, you know, their families. Uh, what, what, what's, the, what's all that for? Oh, oh we're going to get two of every animal, and they're going to come up on the boat with us. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they were, yeah, I guarantee you they were making fun of him, and they were humiliating him. Now, here's something that you need to understand about families in this day in that day of time, where that are kind of lost during this time. During this time that we live today, fam, children are kind of a, and I've got my children here, and I don't want you to feel bad about this, but they're kind of an economic liability, aren't they? Or are they not? They're expensive, okay? Back in the day, up until probably about 60 or 70 years ago, the more children that you had, the more wealth that you had. Why? Because they were hands at work. Okay, they, particularly in agrarian societies or even in industrial societies where they sent the children off to work in the factories, the more children you had, the more wealth and financial support you had in your families. Now, I don't want to go back to those days, but I, but I will tell you that it helped the children to understand that they had an essential part in what was going on and their contribution to the family. My father, I mentioned to, to you a, a little bit about him a little bit earlier. Uh, he's 82 years old right now. His father died when he was 12 years old. He grew up on, on, on a ranch in central Oklahoma. He had a brother that was a year and a half older than him. He had a sister that was, that was five or six years younger than him. He had a, he had a, a little brother who was 10 years younger than him. Do, do the math there. That's a two-year-old brother. And his father died. And they had a ranch. And so he had to shift gears from being a 12-year-old boy. And he and his brother had to be providers on that ranch out in Oklahoma during World War II. And I've heard people say that they never really had those years of being a teenager. Even though he went to school and played football and, and all the other things that the kids around that time did, Still, he found out what, it, what it had to be, what, what he had to do to become a man and provide for his family. Hopefully, you don't have those type of experiences, but it helped him once again to, to understand at an early age what you have to do to be supportive and help your family. Back to the Bible. Noah's sons were righteous men. 
And I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. They were supportive of their families, of their fathers. And, you know, I've talked a little bit about what a father can do to be more stronger in the eyes of God. This morning, I want you to also be able to understand what to do to honor God and to honor your father, which is what Noah's sons did. Here's a couple things that, that we can infer about, about, their, that, about his sons. First of all, they supported the efforts of their father. They didn't build that, he didn't build that ark by himself. He had Noah's three sons. They took the same abuse, probably, that their father did. They stayed on mission with him for well over a decade, probably, building that ark. They put hands and feet and labor into their father's vision. Listen, is there a way that you can support your father? Is there a way that you can encourage your father? We'll talk more about that a little bit later. And secondly, they were righteous men themselves. How do we know, how do we infer that they were righteous men themselves? Because God didn't kill them. Okay, I mean, God was pretty much at the point where he said, I'm going to wipe out everybody except for this one righteous man and his family. I'm going to start over again. If Noah was righteous and his sons were not righteous, God was said, don't let your sons help you. Don't let them in the boat. I'm going to wipe them out too, and I'm going to give you more sons. I'm going to give you more children. But because we can infer that, because God included them, we can infer that they were righteous men as well. All of you have a father. Some of you, your father is no longer with you, or you may not have even known your father. Some of you may have a very difficult relationship with your father. But listen, even unrighteous fathers, if you, if you unfortunately had one, even unrighteous fathers want their children to be righteous. You want to honor your father, righteous or unrighteous? Be, in right, be a righteous man. Well, what about, you, know, you don't understand, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like I, 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 I've got an inheritance of, man, just, just people just been bad, my family tree all the way. Listen, that, that makes it more difficult for you, but it doesn't give you an excuse. God really does end generational curses with people that are willing to stand up and, and be righteous before God. He will help you. He will not desert you. You may have to float upstream a little bit. But then again, that's, that's the Christian life, isn't it? Well, anyway. Now, so they get in the boat. God loads it up. It's, it's a little bit unclear about whether or not you know, God put the animals on there or, or they had to gather them all up, that type of thing. But anyway, they're on the boat. And let me tell you something, folks. They're on that boat for a long time. I won't go into all the math and calculations. Maybe you can, maybe you can work through it and that type of thing and add it all up. But, but for my calculations, as faulty as they may be, it's, it's right about 12 to 13 months they're on that boat. Man, that, that had to be rough. <laughs> with, with, with all the animals, with your family, no air conditioning, no internet, no video games. How did they survive? And that's, but they, they, they came to the end of it got on dry land, we repopulated the earth, it's, it's a wonderful thing, that's the end of the story, or is it? Now here's where I preach to you, I share with you a part of the message that you might not have heard before, okay, it's, and remember Paul Harvey, as he used to say, and now the rest of the story, okay, well here's a story that you might not have read before, you know, it was in verse, chapter 9, verses 18 through 25. If this is offensive to you, well, come by and see me sometime. But take me out to lunch when you do it. Noah's sons who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were Noah's son, and from the whole earth, the earth was populated. Noah, a man of the soil, was the first to plant a vineyard. He drank some of the wine, became drunk, and uncovered himself in his tent. Ham, the father of, of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a cloak and placed it over their shoulders. 
and walked backwards, they covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's father naked. When Noah awoke from his drinking and learned what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Canaan be cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. Now, a little, little sideline here. Even though I've been away from drinking for about 30 years, some of the dumbest stuff I've ever seen in my life, even from good people, happens when a little bit of alcohol gets mixed in. Here we have the last righteous man on earth, and he does something stupid. Alcohol plus anything usually ends up equaling stupid. Think about experiences that you may or may not have had in your life or people that you know it usually, the equation, doing the math, usually ends up equals something remarkably stupid that I could never have dreamed up had happened. And that's what happened with Noah. Okay? Now, this is interesting. I think the reason why Scripture puts this in here, it helps us to remind us that even righteous men are vulnerable. Okay, here we have the most righteous man on the planet, and I don't know why he did this. But he gets plastered and passes out naked. This is embarrassing. Okay? Now, why is Ham cursed because of this? Because if you read between the lines, he was making fun of his father. He was, he made, he was, he was kind of making a joke. We, we can infer that he went to, to his brothers and said, look, look, what our, look what our righteous father did over here. Okay? He wasn't the one to help cover up his father's foolishness. Now, part of the reason why the scripture is so honest on these things is it helps us to understand that nobody's perfect. Your father may have been the greatest person that you've ever known, but he's not perfect. He's not perfect. I am certainly, as a father, am certainly not perfect. Are there things that I wish that I could take back that I've done? Yeah. Yeah, there are. There are. Nobody is perfect. And as sons and daughters, you need to realize that, that your father is not perfect. As much as you love him, as much as you want to honor him. But still, Regardless of how wonderful a man he is, or maybe not so wonderful, Scripture is very clear that we are to honor and obey our parents, to honor our fathers. Now, if it is something that crosses the line between what God says and what your father says, you, you go with God, but you still honor your father. You still show respect. Well, you don't understand. My, my father's not an honorable man. My father has done stuff that's, that are, that's not worthy of respect. He is created in the image of God. God in his providence saw fit that he be your father, even if he made serious mistakes. And folks, this is not just for your father's health. This is also for your own health. If you don't get the, the relationships worked out and the respect in order, if you allow yourself to continue to be a victim, you will always become a victim. This will be a, something in your spiritual development that you will always be hung up on. So listen, here are four things that, that, I, that ways that I suggest to you that, that you can honor your father. First of all, affirm him. Affirm him. Fathers are like anybody else. We may kind of think, with the, you know, kind of give the, the, the appearance that we're above everything and nothing bothers us and that type of thing, but we still have the same vulnerabilities and struggles and insecurities that anybody else has. A lot of us are trying to do it right. Yes, do we have guidelines here in Scripture? Yes. But sometimes we 
make mistakes. And sometimes we do things right. Affirmation goes a long way. A big part of my ministry as your pastor is to pat you on the back, encourage you, say, way to go. And I tell you what, that, that's been kind of how I've done ministry for the past 28, 29 years. It's paid off big time. What, what happens when you're affirmed and encouraged? Well, you want to do more. Same thing with your father. When you encourage him, with you, when you affirm him, when you say, boy, Dad, I'm proud of you. Way to go, Dad. Father, I caught you doing something right. Do you think that matters to him? Do you think that, that strengthens your relationship with him? Absolutely. When I graduated from college, of course, my parents put me through college at Oklahoma State University. At, when I graduated, I made sure that I put together a plaque that, that said, you know, I forget what all I said, but basically words of appreciation for them put me through four years of college. It's on their wall. Now, I don't know if, how much they appreciate it. I, I assume they do. But I tell you what, when I walk by it, I always have a sense of pride and appreciation from them. I still keep notes from my children that they gave to me years ago. Every once in a while, I open up the file and look at them and say, oh, at least somebody used to like me, and probably still do. Affirm your father. It makes a big difference. Number two, engage your father. Work on being able to spend time with him. Now, probably a lot of you have things that, that you have in common, whether, whether you're the daughter or the son. You have things, if your father's still with us, you have things that, that you have in common. He might have showed you how to do that. You, that might be... Uh, sports, it might be hunting, it might be fishing, what have you. Wonderful. Continue to engage those things. But also, some of you may be totally different than your father. Some of you may not have much in common with your father. I'll tell you what, particularly if you're a grown-up, be a grown-up. And, and, and try to find things that you, that you can have in, in common with your father now that you're mature. Engage your father. Build that relationship. And number, number three, don't be so stubborn. You don't have to have your way all the time. Some of you think, and you could be 40, 50, 60 years old, or 15 years old, some of you think that the way to maturity is to stand in defiance of your father. That's foolishness. That's immaturity. You don't have to have your way all the time. If there's something that gets under your father's skin that, that, that's, that's a point of contention, don't go there. Work on building that relationship with your father. Don't be stubborn. If you don't work that out with your own father, if you insist on being stubborn in your relationships, you're going to be stubborn in all your relationships. And maybe you'll figure that out when you have almost no friends and three or four marriages. We learn some of our basic relationships first in how we relate with our parents, which gives us the strength to go on and do so with other significant relationships in our lives. And also, finally, forgive him. I mentioned to you, fathers are not perfect. Some of them may have things, have done things or not done things in your life. And here you are now, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, and you're not over him, over it. Listen, here's a little secret. Forgiveness is the gift that you give to yourself. Forgiveness does more to create health in your life than it does the person that you forgive. Does that mean that, you, get, that you, you make yourself vulnerable to the same bad behavior? No, it doesn't. It just means that you're no longer holding that person accountable for the harm that they've done in your life. Forgive them. Move on. Ask God to give you the power to do that, and you're going to sell, save yourself a lot of grief. You're going to save yourself a lot of, a lot of money in, in, in counselors. You're going to be able to move past, cycle past the hurt, and move on to spiritual health. Fathers, 
It was kind of a strange, strange sermon today. We saw a righteous father, and we saw a father that frankly blew it. But we also saw ways that we can support our fathers, that we can encourage our fathers, that we can get over past hurts and heal those relationships. God is all about healing. God is all about reconciliation. God is the example of what the perfect father is. We have a problem. We have a sin problem. Sin separates us from God. But because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity for reconciliation. See, God is all about reconciliation, healing that wound between us and God. All you have to do, you can't earn it. You can't make God love you enough because he already loves you enough to reach out to you and to call you unto himself. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? We give you the opportunity to come forward to do that. Whatever God has laid on your heart, whatever decision he's laid on your heart, you're invited to come. Please stand.